All right, well, we're going to get into a new series today called The Seven C's or The Seven Keys of History. Uh, I like this series. It, it's basically going to be an overview of the entire Bible and God's plans at work. And so we're going to go through all these seven. Uh, it'll take us from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between, uh, with today being the creation story of God's story of creation. And this uh, is not a series I developed. My mentor preached on this a while ago. Uh, it first came from the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry, where they had come up with these this way of teaching what God is doing in the earth and God's plan for the earth. Uh, the, the theme being in Daniel 221, he controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. So that is just the testimony to say it is God in control of everything. It is God who reigns. It is God who rules. It is God at the beginning. It is God at the end. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Revelation 22, 21 and 22, Jesus says, you can be sure I'm coming again. And then, then John responds by saying, Amen, come Lord Jesus. So it begins with God, it ends with God, everything in between is God setting up, God renewing, God making it so. And so we have all of this then to say, what is God doing in the earth? And it's this way of teaching it, these seven keys. They're going to be important to understanding in order to get to the next one. Uh, and, and the nice thing is they're easy to remember. They, they all start with C. Uh, and so I'll give you all of them. Depending on what book you read, because it's been adapted over the years, the, the words might be different, uh, but there, there are seven main themes. Today being creation, and then we'll talk about corruption or contamination, and then after that comes catastrophe, and then I'm not sure which one we'll use yet, but number four is either confusion or chosen, depending on which one we want to talk about, and we'll see where the Lord leads. Then after that comes Christ, and then it comes number six, the cross or the church, and then finally number seven, consummation, the judgment where Jesus returns, where Jesus sets up his kingdom, where Jesus rules. And so today we're going to get into the story of creation. Now some people don't like to focus on the details, and uh, they, there's different beliefs about creation today. Uh, there are three main views of creation. I'm going to go over them all. Uh, not every view is created equal. In fact, there are two that I absolutely do not like, and then I would be what you would call a creationist. Um, it means I believe in the literal Genesis account of creation, and we'll get into all of that. Uh, but I, I think this is important because the world attacks the creation story today. Uh, the world attacks it very, very strongly with the theory of evolution, telling people we've, we've evolved from nothing more than monkeys. And, and it's become so indoctrinated. I mean, kids hear about it from the very young age. It becomes so indoctrinated that, that by the time we get to adults, it's so ingrained in us that you'll even find Christians who fight you tooth and nail for the theory of evolution. And it just baffles me. But I think it's important because this is the foundation story. And you might not say, well, why is it so important? But if we can t start taking parts of Genesis out of context or start saying parts of Genesis aren't true, you know, if we teach our children, oh, that's not really what the Bible means, then what happens when they come along? Who's to say John 3.16 means what it means? Who's to say Christ is who he says he is? If we can't trust the word of God from the beginning, what makes us say we can trust it in the end? What makes it say we can trust Jesus? And so for me, it's all or nothing. It's, it's the word of God or it's not. And so you can't start, because once you start picking and choosing, then you have a foundation of sand. You have a foundation of sand that just cannot hold up to the world today. Which is why, you want to know why many of our children are leaving the church when they go to college? It's because we as the church, we've given them a very bad foundation. We've not given them anything to stand on. And so when they go to college and they're challenged by professors, they immediately cave because these professors are supposed to be intelligent. They're supposed to, to know better. They have these big fancy degrees. But I don't care if there's a room full of people who have big fancy degrees. I don't care if there's a person who's read every work ever created in humanity. There's nobody smarter than my God. There's nobody smarter than our God. And, and the big, the, the, the smartest scientist in all the world, he wasn't there at the creation. So his best thing is to guess what happened. I'm going to take the trick source of the one who was there. You know, the Bible tells us in Isaiah, God says, who can inform me? Who do I ask? And, and I think that's where we need to come from. God's word is true no matter what. 
And, and, and I think we need to be very, very careful because sometimes we talk about, well, science proves the Bible or scientific discovery and, and that we can prove the Bible. But we got to be very careful about our wording. I don't need science to prove the Bible. I use the Bible to prove science. I use the Bible to prove history. Because if we start saying things like, oh, science proves the Bible or history proves the Bible, that makes science and history our main source of, of our main foundation of knowledge, our foundation of reason. And so then when, when, then when they do disagree, then we automatically turn to say, oh, science disagrees. Let's find some ways to, 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 to compromise. This is the foundation of truth. This doesn't change. This never will change. So again, the three theories of, of how creation started, and I'm going to go over them just real quick because we do have fellowship time. Uh, and so if the, the longer message will be on my YouTube channel. And, and you have to understand all these three creations, they don't agree with themselves. There's a lot of variety among them, but I'm going to go over just a brief overview of them all. The first one, probably the most popular, definitely the most popular among the world is evolution. Evolution has basic tenets, three basic tenets. Number one, everything started with a big bang, a random explosion that happened uh, an umpteen amount of year, billions of years ago. And, it's, and then life was created out of nothing. Life was created by chance. And uh, then organisms developed over a long, long period of time. So those are the basic tenets of evolution. The, the basic formula of evolution is mutation, plus natural selection, plus lots and lots of time equals evolution. Well, now, the problem that we run into is evolution is based on a little bit of truth, but then it's expanded to be full of lies. And when I say based on a little bit of truth, natural selection is a real thing we see in the world today. Natural selection merely states that a creature best adapted to his environment will be the one to reproduce and pass on those traits to other creatures. And we see that. I mean, look at how many different types of dogs we have, how many different types of, of, of cats we have, or, or horses. You, you know, we breed horses with the best quality to have race horses, to be faster, to have more endurance. That's natural selection. The dominant traits that are good, they pass on to the future generations, and we've been able to manipulate quite a bit, but we've never created it. We've never turned one species into a new species. No matter how long it takes, a dog will always be a dog, a cat will always be a cat. The Bible says that we will produce within their kind, within their kind. Uh, a cat will not be a dog, a dog will not be a cat. And, and so the problem is, Darwin observed this. Darwin observed this natural selection. But he, then he expounded it to say, oh, things evolved. In fact, the evolutionists say we all evolved from a single cell protozoan that was created in a pool of water and then over billions and uh, millions and millions of years developed the life we know today. According to evolutionists, you are all just a highly evolved ape, a simian species, and you developed language, you've developed the ability to reason, but nothing more than an animal. I love my fiance. She always says, if somebody tells me I'm an ape, I say, well, you might be from an ape, but I'm not. I'm created in the image of God. Evolution says that apes came from amphibians, amphibians came from fish, fish came from single-celled, whatever. The problem is, we have never, ever observed this in the world today. We will never observe it in the world today. And it is taught in such a way, and I know this, I took an evolution class in school. It's taught like it's law. But it's called the theory of evolution. It's never, ever, ever, ever been proven. Really, what evolution does is evolution takes creation and takes God out and tells people, you don't need God. Now, there are many problems with evolution. And I mean many problems. If you ever go to the Ark or the Creation Museum, wow, they do a great job. And if you want to uh, look on, on their website, it's called answersingenesis.org. Fantastic. What I love about this is I'm a pastor. Yes, I don't have a degree in science. I don't have a degree in, in biology. I don't have a degree in that. I have a degree in pastoral ministry. But Answers in Genesis, they have Christians who are geneticists, Christians who are geologists, Christians who are highly, highly educated. Some of them from different, some of them from very prestigious schools of science. And why I love that is it shows because the world has this idea of thinking if you believe the Bible, you're this flat earther that doesn't know any better. But there are very, very intelligent people who argue for what the Bible says. I just want to show you, I just want to talk to you about a few holes in evolution. Number one, mutations. 
Mutations are never, ever, 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 ever useful. Some mutations that we might commonly see is if you've ever if you've ever had a cow with two heads. If you're a farmer and you've seen a cow born with two heads, or sometimes there's snakes with two heads, or there are different mutations in our genes. But mutations are always, always, always destructive. A lot of our developmental disabilities come from a mutated cell that destroys. Cancer is a cell mutation that's gone out of control. Mutations are never, ever, ever useful. Number one, it's and number two, it's never ever been observed in our known world. And it's mathematically improbable. What do I mean by that? Well, evolution, they say, uh, uh, is, they say our Earth is 14.6 billion years old, roughly. And then life started so many millions of years ago. And, and so there was, a, there was an old joke to talk about the, the probability of evolution. And the joke went along, if you had a million monkeys with a million typewriters in a room and you gave them a million years, could they write Shakespeare? And so a mathematician, Dr. Dr. Bolton was his name, did a study. said, how long would it take a million monkeys with a million typewriters to write Shakespeare? And he found that just the first two words of Hamlet, or the first line of Hamlet, the first line of Hamlet is who's there. And he found that it would take roughly... 400 and, or I'm sorry, 284 trillion years for the monkeys to write two words. Or to, uh, two, yeah, two words, who's there? 400, or I'm sorry, 284 trillion years. And they say evolution created all of this in 14.6 billion years. Now, just let me, let me, let me, let me explain it to you this way. If this is your first time in the church today, I, I see, I see a lot of us have been here before. If I were to stand up here as your pastor and I would say, man, look at this building. Wow. Do you know this all happened by chance? I mean, just one day the bricks got together. Just one day all these random things started to come together. The plumbing just worked out so perfectly. Everything works out. When we turn on the lights, the lights turn on because the wires all got together. This all happened by chance. I mean, you think I'm crazy. And I'll tell you what, this building is nowhere near as complicated as our human body. This building is nowhere near as complicated as our, as our, as our world today. And the final thing, which might bring back memories of your high school math class. But the second law of thermodynamics, and maybe Rod, Rod could explain that better than me. But the second law of thermodynamics, which basically states energy is never created nor destroyed. It's just transferred. And the problem with that is, is all the universe follows the second law of thermodynamics. That's why it's called a law. But what the scientists say, and the reason I say it's bad science, is they say somehow this law was suspended for the creation of the universe because random energy was created out of nothing. Energy in a closed system always remains constant unless more energy is added into it. And so, and, and the problem is the second law of thermodynamics has this term called entropy, which means a loss of usable energy. Which is basically to say when one, when one form of energy is turned into another form, there's a loss of usable energy. The new form has less than the first form because there's loss due to different environmental things. For example, if you have a bike and you're going downhill, eventually you'll stop moving unless you add more and more energy to the system. Because there's energy that's lost due to friction, there's energy that's lost due to air resistance, all of this. If you burn wood in a fire... The, the, the end product, the charcoal, has less energy than the original wood because there was energy lost due to heat, lost due to the fire. And so basically, entropy says our world is wasting away slowly, slowly, slowly because everything, there's less usable energy. But evolutionists say we're getting better and better and better. Our world's evolving. Our world's constantly changing. Now, would anyone be brave enough... To tell me what, what, what's better about our world than five years ago? Yeah. Now, thank you, thank you. Ten years ago, 50 years ago. And, and some could argue, well, technology is better. Okay, but technology is roading away our society. One example of that is, 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 our, is our live stream for church. Now, don't get me wrong. I am so grateful we can stream for people who can't be here. But do you know how many people make excuses now not to come in the church because we have this technology? I mean, yes, as technology develops, great 
wonderful, but it's eroding our society. Do you know AI now, you can literally put prompts into an AI and have a whole paper generated with sources and articles? Our kids aren't going to learn anything in college anymore. So that's just one. That's, that's evolution. Again, I don't agree with it. I think it's hogwash. I think it's, it's worthless. Now, the problem is Christians came along and Christians said, okay, well, evolution is what the world believes and we believe in the Bible. Let's merge the two. And they created what they call theistic evolution, which is the basic assumption that says God directed, used, and controlled the naturalistic, naturalistic evolutionary process to make the world, which basically says God made the world through evolution. And those that believe it hold to what they call a gap theory between Genesis 1.1 and Genesis 1.2. In Genesis 1, 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty. And that's verse 2. And, and in between there is where we get the millions and millions and millions of years. Now, just real quick, one problem with that is the Bible tells us that death is a result of sin. If you have millions and millions of years and you have fossils, which are what they say, before Adam and Eve, then there was death before Adam and Eve, and the world was not created perfect. The Bible tells us that God created perfect creation, and it was only after that that death entered the world. And, and I could get into more of this. Uh, the, the Bible says days. I believe what the Bible says. It says, then evening passed and morning came, marking the first day, marking the second day. I mean, God's word is very clear and very specific. And if you want to hold to theistic evolution, you're going to have to make severe compromises on the word of God. And so finally, then, we have the, the, what I believe, and, and again, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going faster than I would like, but we do have fellowship is the Bible says God created the world. This is the idea of creationism. And there's different laws that go with creationism. Number one, all was created by God. God created everything out of nothing. That's in Romans 4 verse 17. And, and this, is where, where, this is where Paul praises God who brings the dead to life and creates, not, creates everything out of nothing. So that idea of creation is not a random chance. It is God who has the power to bring nothing or to bring, to bring something out of nothing. Apart from God, none of us can create something out of nothing. There always has to be something that acts on it. Random chance cannot do that. That's an attribute of God. Number two, the Bible is the final authority. It is God's word that has that final authority. And number three, which I think is the most important, man is made in the image of God with no prior circumstances, no prior stages. You were created, the Bible tells us in Genesis 1.26, Adam was formed by God's hands. His breath of life was breathed into him. And the Bible tells us that every single person since then who was in the womb, David says, God knit us together. God knitted us in our mother's womb, giving us exactly all the personality he wanted us to have, all the features he wanted us to have. And if we're going to say we evolved from apes, then I got to tell you, at what point are we, were, were we made in the image of God? At what point did God say, okay, now they're in my image? Because I've got to tell you something. Jesus came to die for us. He didn't die for the chimpanzees. And if they're our, if they're our long lost cousins, then, then why, are they, why are they left out? And then this is where it gets a lot of people, but I believe the earth is relatively young. I believe creation happened in 404 BC, which would make the earth about 6,000 years old. And why I believe that is because the first 11 books of Genesis, the genealogies, that's how old it records the earth to be. And I'm going to believe what the Bible says. And so a couple laws then. In Revelation 4.11, God creates everything and uses everything. Psalm 24 verse 1, God owns everything. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Exodus 20.11, God made everything in six 24-hour days. Genesis 1-3, God spoke everything into existence. It was not random chance. And I will say, and some people say, well, why is this important to know? And I would say, because if you refuse Genesis, then you undermine the rest of the Bible. You don't have a good foundation to build on. You don't have a good foundation. And, and where do you draw the line then? At what point do you draw that line? Some people say the first 11 books of Genesis is all, is all allegorical and then it becomes history. But where would you draw that line? If you believe in evolution, there's parts of the Bible you have to throw out. In fact, I'll say you have to throw out all the Bible. If you believe in theistic evolution, there are parts of the Bible you have to take out of context and you have to make compromises. It is only the solid root of creationism that allows a holistic view of scripture. And if you don't hold to that, then everything else is built on a foundation of sand and you might as well throw it out. 
And I will say why I think it's so important, and, and I put this back there with the bulletins. I would, I would love for you to take a copy. There's two sides. Uh, number one is why, is why is biblical creation important? And the, number, the other side, and I'm sorry it's not printed real well because it's an old paper, but it's the only one I have. Uh, why uh, the difference between man's word and God's word? And I just want to take just a little bit to say why I think it's so dangerous. Evolution tells people they're not special. Evolution tells people you're a product of randomness, that there's nothing important about your life, that you are just a highly evolved animal. And if you tell somebody that, and if people hold to that, then there is no universal right and wrong. It's whatever you make it. Evolutionist, if you hold to the strict evolutionary principle, then, then even the most heinous crimes like rape and murder are not inherently evil if they're evolutionary beneficial to you. And that's terrible. But it says that people have no intrinsic worth. They are just merely animals. And I'll say one of the most heinous crimes I see is the crime and the sin of abortion. But by purely evolutionary standpoints, there's nothing wrong with abortion. You know what they tell you? And here's the argument. Here's the argument I've heard for abortion. One lady got up front and said, we need abortion. And they say, why do we need abortion? Because the rates of Down syndrome have, been, ha have severely decreased. That's why abortion is good. Because the rates of Down syndrome has decreased. Why? Because the moment they see that their child might have Down syndrome, the, the doctor says that life is not worth living, there's no evolutionary advantage to that, kill them. And uh, there was a powerful testimony, which you can look it up, but there was somebody at a pro-life conference who had Down syndrome, and, and um, he got up and talked very well, and, and he said, don't you dare tell me my life's not worth living. Don't you dare tell me. And, and trust me, I have met many, many parents with Down syndrome children, Yes, they, they, there can be struggles, but boy, there's, they, they're, there's so much joy also. There's so much joy also. And there's so many blessings to that. And I've heard many testimonies of parents that say they don't want to change their child one bit because that's their child. But it is, it is this evolution that teaches there's no intrinsic worth. So if life is inconvenient, it says snuff it out. One thing we don't often talk about is the principles of slavery and even what Hitler did. As terrible as what Hitler did, were all based on evolutionary pr principles. Hitler wanted to make a master race. Hitler followed eugenics. Hitler thought the Jews were, were the scum of society and should be wiped out. And that's really what, what evolution says. When, when the more evolved comes onto the scene, the first thing they do is they wipe out those that are less evolved. Evolution says that life started in Africa. And so the people living closer to Africa are less evolved than the people living further and further away. Which obviously, if you know Africa, that's where the, that's where the African Americans, the black people, that's where they're from. And so it was by evolutionary principles that we in the West, we said it is our job to civilize them. They are less evolved than us. They are like apes and we need to civilize them that we brought them into society as our slaves. But the Bible tells a different story. The Bible says each and every one of us was created in the image of God with worth and value. And the Bible tells us where evolution says your life doesn't matter. The Bible tells us that God knows where, when a sparrow falls from the trees. And you are so much more precious than the sparrows. The Bible says that there is nothing important about you. Well, I'm sorry. Evolution says there's nothing important about you. But the Bible says for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son. The Bible says that you are so important that God sent his only perfect son to die on the cross for you. Because there was sin, there was corruption, but God says, I will redeem you. Yes. And that is why I believe it is so important. We can't just tell our children they're animals because they're not. They're made in the image of God. And that's where we need to start. We are products of God. Not random chance, not randomness in this world. We were made specific for God. And guess what? God says that he has a purpose for each and every single one of us. So not only did God make us by his design, but he made us perfect for whatever he's called us to. I love this image of God knitting this baby together in the womb and thinking all, almost seeing the life flash before the screen. What's this child going to do? What's this child going to do for me? And God giving him all the qualities that the child needs to serve out his God-given purpose. There is an emptiness in a person when they refuse God. I think that is why there are so many drugs, there are so many, there are so many people that have depression, there are so many people who kill themselves, because they're told they don't matter. And they deny, if they're made in the image of God, they deny that image and it breaks them to their core. And they want to escape, and for many, the only way to escape is at the bottom of the pillbox, the bottom of the bottle, or at the end of a gun barrel, which is what we see all over. 
But it is the Bible that comes along and says, no, you are precious. No, you are perfect. It is the Bible that comes along and says, God loves you. And there's a future and a hope for you. And it is that that we're going to start with. God's creation. And then after that, unfortunately, next week we get into sin. But even in sin, God shows mercy is in the fact that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, I praise you for who you are, all that you do for us, Lord, all that you are for us, Father. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the creator, God. And Lord, we are so grateful for that. And I pray that we would give this message to the world, Lord, the message that says we are made in your image, that your son died for us on the cross. Father God, we are not worthy of you, but you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. And I pray that we live a life for him. And Lord, for those who don't know you, I pray that we could provide this powerful witness that they need. It is in the holy and precious name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said, amen. And we're going to go ahead and cut the last song. <laughs> now it has been our habit, but let us go over and fellowship. But I want you to, each of you, to walk out of here knowing that you are God's precious children. He made you just the way he wanted you. And sure, I might, there might have some complaints that you want to say. I wish I had this. I wish I had this. But God made you just the way he wanted you. And you don't need anything else. Amen. All right, let's go have some fellowship and cookies. I'm assuming there's cookies, man.